pilots slash flight crews of Reddit. What went wrong on your flight that the passengers never knew about? I'm a bush pilot in Canada. I was working the right seat of a turbo otter. We were taking off from a short strip in the middle of nowhere with six drillers in the back and a bunch of gear. Captain started the engine as I was just finishing up the passenger briefing. I thought he was just positioning the plane to prepare for takeoff. But then he gave it full throttle. I didn't even have my seat belt or headset on yet. I'm focusing on getting this stuff on when I realize something isn't right. Getting closer to the end of the strip. Captain starts to panic as we aren't getting airborne. His hands were shaking like mad and he kept reaching for things but he couldn't figure out what was wrong. I think he was too busy looking at the trees and creek right ahead of us. I realized the problem. He was in such a rush to leave that he didn't do a pre-takeoff check. Propeller was still in full course, feathered on shutdown. It should have been full fine for takeoff. I yelled slash gestured to him the problem and immediately pushed the prop forward. Engine had a huge surge and we just barely cleared the trees at the end of the strip. He acted like nothing happened for the rest of the flight. We didn't even speak a single word to each other. I suspect none of the passengers even realized what had happened and how close we were to being another statistic. When we got back to the airport I told him I was leaving. Packed my bags and never looked back. Great example of why checklists and procedure are always so important no matter how good someone thinks they are. A colleague of mine was flying with a captain who couldn't stop giggling since he got on board his 737. Only when they were cruising that the captain took out a yellow live baby duck from his flight bag. Couldn't believe the story but the dude recorded a video of the little duck chilling in the sun on top of the mode control panel. Girlfriend is a flight attendant. So I asked her for a few stories. One, upon landing, one of the tires blew out. It pretty much just resulted in a bigger jolt than usual. And although a few passengers commented on it, the crew just played it off as a more or less regular landing. Girlfriend, what are you gonna do? Tell everybody a tire just blew and get them all panic question mark too. At least once a week, there's an armed, plainclothes federal air marshal riding on the plane. Usually in first class, there there is a security measure, in case the cockpit is breached or something. Even if people are aware that air marshals are a thing, usually portrayed in Hollywood as escorting a criminal, they don't realize the frequency with which the marshals ride along on planes. 3. A guy on the plane was from a connecting flight from a Eurasian airline, with a boarding pass under some other woman's name. The woman happened to be on the flight as well, so he obviously didn't belong. The guy could have stayed if he had just gone through TSA again. But he refused to go through the process and was very strongly insistent on talking to the captain directly. Big red flag right there. No idea what the real story was she believes that it was a foiled terrorism attempt but the crew treated it as a simple duplicate boarding pass problem. Again, the problem was dealt with and you don't want to unnecessarily worry the passengers. 4. A lot of people try to join the Mile High Club. Like, a lot. I wasn't the crew on either. But my service had two pretty severe bird strikes within several weeks of each other. One was a hawk of some kind and the second was a duck. The duck strike happened with a patient loaded. Evidently just as the pilot was flipping his NVGs up, the duck came through the windscreen and went to smithereens along with all the plexiglass. I helped clean up the back of the helicopter later. And it looked like a duck had swallowed a duck of lit dynamite. The strike also happened at the exact moment the med crew had pushed a medication that relaxes all the muscles in the patient's body, including breathing muscles. And in spite of the chaos they continued their procedure and successfully controlled the patient's airway. The pilot also continued the flight in spite of being covered in duck blood slash guts slash feathers, as well as his own blood from his broken nose. The crew, and the other bird strike crew, received commendations for their calm composure under the circumstances. It's pretty mind-boggling the damage a several pound bird can inflict. Not a pilot, but one of my buddies is. We were talking about one of the more remote airports that we'd both visited, located in a difficult place that has a lot of wind shear. So passengers are used to having the plane make a couple of attempts when landing. Anyway, my friend said the sensors for the landing gear malfunctioned, so he couldn't tell whether the wheels were down or if they'd gotten stuck. He flew low, made an announcement to the cabin that they needed to circle the runway because of the wind, and made a call to the control tower asking for someone to make a visual confirmation that the landing gear was fully deployed. In the summer of 1984, I had just graduated from high school and been accepted into USC's astronomy program, but the right stuff hit the dollar theater. And after watching it four times in a week I am determined to change my major to aerospace engineering. My mother is flying with me to Los Angeles, where I am going to start school, and I am reading the right stuff on the plane. In it there is a section where Wolf talks about how commercial pilots all adopted this sort of southern drawl. A copying of Chuck Yeager's, because it sounded so reassuring. Well, folks, we have this little old light up here to tell me if the gears are down and locked, and that old light ain't coming on. Now I've flown a lot of these babies and when that light won't go on, it is almost always the bulb that burned out, so we are gonna be just fine. But just to be on the safe side, our little ladies are gonna show you a special way to sit. My mother and I are sitting on either side of the aisle and we're on approach into LA. 
I hear the clunk of the landing gear doors open and the whine as they are extended, and then another whine, whine again, whine, silence, whine, the captain is retracting and re-extending the gear in the hope that if the lock is stuck it will unstick, then the engines increase power and the plane starts ascending again, we are climbing out over the ocean, and as we execute a turn, we are dumping fuel, I'm thinking, this is not happening, the pilot comes on and says he's having a minor issue with a switch, then the pilot comes walking down the aisle, kneels, rips up the carpeting, opens a small door, and starts fiddling inside it. Wolf describes how there is a periscope on the belly of an aircraft, and the pilot will use it to visually inspect the gear. So I'm watching this guy do that and wondering how my sister will cope with both me and my mother dying on this plane. When my mother asked me what's going on, and I looked her square in the face and calmly reminded her that the pilot said he had a switch problem. There's a junction box in the floor. He's checking the breakers. The pilot gave us the it's always the little old light that's the problem. Speech, we landed in crash positions, braked past lines of fire trucks staged into position down the runway, and taxied to our gate like nothing was wrong, it was the light after all, and once a bunch of us were returning from a job in Germany, the plane was a scheduled flight on a small, 50 seat or so, turboprop aircraft, and it was a bumpy flight, I am fairly well traveled, and working on aircraft made me more confident than most of flying, but the turbulence started to get so bad that I was getting nervous, nobody except the flight crew were allowed to unfasten their seatbelts, and even they were being thrown about as they tried to move around. It was by far the worst flight I have been on. So anyway, just as things were getting to the peak of shittiness, one of the stewardesses made her way to one of my colleagues sitting across the aisle, and said, in a hushed tone excuse me sir, is it true that you guys are aircraft engineers? We have a slight problem out the back, and thought you might be able to help. I honestly thought we were going to die, that the bumpiness was not down to turbulence, but some flight system had gone AWOL. I didn't know what the fuck any of us would be able to do on unfamiliar equipment with no documentation, no spares and no tools, but sure enough my colleague went off with the stewardess and disappeared through the door out of the cabin. Ten minutes late he was back, and of course we were keen to know what the problem was and if he was able to do anything about it. The problem turned out to be a ratchet strap on one of the cupboard doors in the galley was jammed so they couldn't get the snacks out. The flight continued to be horrible, and the snacks were predictably shit. As a child, my family and I spent a few days in the Bahamas and as we were at the outdoor airport slash single runway we discovered that we were flying an eight-seater single prop plane back to Florida. The first time taxiing down the runway, the pilots discovered something was wrong with the engine so they pulled off to the side and made us sit next to the plane as they attempted to fix the engine. After being told that the plane was functioning again, we boarded and began to taxi down the runway again. I was watching the pilot and co-pilot do their thing when I noticed the airspeed indicator drop to zero as we were about to lift off. At this point we were running out of runway and I watched as the co-pilot jabbed the non-working gauge with his palm and the gauge began to work again. The pilots then looked at each other, back at us, then back at each other before laughing. Dad's a pilot, so I get to hear all of these. Good one that comes to mind, mind you. He flies 737s for a major airline, getting ready to take off at night. He sees a plane about to land on the taxiway he's waiting on. He immediately just starts turning on every exterior light on the plane. Other plane pulled out a final descent at like 500 feet. Edit, just talk to him on the phone about it. He said it was back when he was flying the 727. So about 15 years ago now. He remembers seeing the plane coming down. And the captain was looking back over his shoulder at another plane. So my dad starts throwing on all of the lights. At which point the captain turns around and starts asking him what he's doing. And sees the plane. And then both of them literally just duck. And wait for something to happen. And after a couple of seconds, when it's clear the plane wasn't going to hit, they both sit up, and my dad starts trying to call the tower. The tower is just not responding at all for a bit. And then a lady comes on, the dispatcher had been a man, and basically says, when you get to your destination, call this number. And the dispatcher and the pilot of the other plane both lost their licenses. Cockroach in the cockpit, red eye from LAX. One of us was strapped in while the other one hunted for the little fucker. I was flying a Piper Navajo that seats eight passengers out of a small airport. We were making all of our required radio calls. But because this was a small uncontrolled airport some people in small airplanes will operate without radios or just don't care enough to broadcast their position. Anyway we were doing our due diligence but not long after take off and while leaving the traffic pattern my foe says shit. And takes control from me and make a relatively aggressive, for passengers at least, turn to the right. As he does this I see a Cessna out my left window no more than 150 feet below us. We essentially climb through the altitude he was crossing in and turn to avoid him. Only one passenger noticed when we got to the destination and he told us it was a good move. Good times. My dad used to fly cable patrols and a Navajo dropping leaflets on trawling vessels in the vicinity of subsea cables. Much of the time they'd be cruising low below the ceilings and sometimes even below 100 to 200 feet. 
occasionally a band of low cloud or fog would appear and they would just pass through it rather than maneuver in instrument conditions and then have to relocate the cable. Once dad told of passing through a band of low cloud and coming out the other side to see an iceberg less than two miles ahead and stretching above the altitude they were flying at. Said he was never really comfortable doing cable patrols on cloudy days after that. It was a flight from Kansas to Oregon, and as we were mid-flight, a hawk fucking dive-bombed the wing and dented it. The pilot announced the subtle thud as minor turbulence, but the crew knew what had happened. No one knew how the hell the hawk was flying so high. It was a smaller plane, so we only had one and a half dozen people not counting us crew members. The dent didn't actually meds with flight too much, but it's a hell of a story to tell. I fly on a Beechcraft 1900, C&D models, varies flight to flight quite frequently. It's a similar size to what you described in fact. Every once in a while I'll see a bird shoot past my window at insane heights. But yeah, a hawk saying fuck this plane in particular is one hell of a story. Not me but my father. Years ago when dad was flying the 767 for Air Canada they were coming out of London Heathrow back to Canada in the winter time and some snow had started to fall. Heathrow 10 years ago was notorious for letting a dusting of snow hamper operations. Dad and crew expedited boarding and pre-flight as much as they could and pulled the brakes and pushed back early to get ahead in the queue for takeoff. They couldn't get a taxi clearance right away as a number of aircraft ahead of them had opted to wait for the heaviest of the snow to pass prior to taking off and then controllers wouldn't move them out of the way. Dad basically begged them to move them ahead somehow, as he had been around the block a time or two and knew what was coming, but to avail. Ground had them park the airplane and they sat loaded at the gate for 4 hours before all flights out were cancelled. Over 4 inches of snow. The airport's inability to deal with the snow and backlog of traffic meant that Air Canada couldn't get a plane out for 3 more days, by which time they had brought extra aircraft over from Montreal to try to relieve some of the buildup. So in this story what the passengers didn't know is that if they were maybe 10 minutes faster boarding the plane they wouldn't have gotten stuck in London for an extra 3 days. Was flying out of MSP and there was a storm coming in. Flights were cancelled. Traffic is delayed, tempers are high, but our flight was still on for now. People were dicking around as usual getting to their seats and their bags stowed. Suddenly the PA blares. People, if we are not airborne in 10 minutes, you are spending the night, sit, down. Never saw people on an airplane move so fast. We beat the storm and I made it home that night. I was giving my sister and a friend a tour of the Chicago skyline over Lake Michigan. We are all having a good time. Suddenly, the engine goes quiet. A nightmare especially because I only have one of them. The silence was noticeable and my sister starts looks at me and starts to panic. The engine comes back within about 3 seconds alive and well. And I head for the nearest airport, in a small propeller plane. It is hard to hide the silence of the engine, but since it came back, I acted like nothing happened. I don't think they realize how critical of a situation it almost was. I was asked this question by a passenger while I was experiencing a problem with the rudder slash brake pedals in the plane I was flying. He basically asked what was the most urgent situation was I had encountered while in flight. Little did he know that it was happening in real time at that moment. I had called the tower of my destination airport to report my position and request landing. As I'm going through my checklist I positioned my feet on the rudder pedals to have authority of the tow brakes to slow the aircraft after landing. As I moved my foot on the right pedal it sort of flopped forward. What does this mean? A couple potential problems, especially while on approach for landing. With the pedal flopped forward it meant the top of the pedal would be pushed into the firewall and severely limit right rudder control. Not having bilateral brake control greatly increases the likelihood of a ground loop, or spinning out of control and flipping the plane over or off the runway. I narrated the problem to my passenger as I acted out the physical inspection to try to solve the problem. I reached down with my hand and flipped the pedal back up so that it was at least in the right position. Apparently the linkage for the right brake had become disconnected. I knew that if I put the plane on the numbers I had almost 5,000 feet to roll out and clear the runway for the next aircraft. I made an uneventful landing and just rolled and rolled with light left brake and some counter steering to keep the plane under control while it naturally slowed. The controller asked me to expedite clearing the runway and I replied that I would but I still rolled until I could just steer naturally off the runway. The passenger had no idea that I was encountering my first significant mechanical failure. I was just over 100 hours of flight time and working at a flight school as a dispatcher and front office person on Sundays. My passenger was someone that one of our clients had dropped off at another airport and was unable to pick him up. I told the guy I'd come get him after my shift if he'd cover half the rate of the plane of my choice. I was extremely familiar with the aircraft I chose but a cotter key failed and allowed the brake linkage to disconnect. Everyone lived. As a kid, 8 to 9, I flew in a small plane with my Air Force dad and his friend. We lived in Minot, North Dakota, big base there and were flying sometime in winter. Later I learned we had such a long joy flight that day because the landing gear froze up, and we were flying around trying to get them to come down. As we were almost out of fuel they were planning to crash land on the frozen river, when in the nick of time the landing gear unfroze and deployed. 
I had no idea though. It was beautiful flying above a winter wonderland. Shit breaks all the time. Normally nothing so bad that the plane is gonna crash, but important enough that we take some sort of corrective action. The systems in planes, I fly a corporate jet, are so redundant and interconnected that you don't always know for sure what's actually broke. Example, you might get a message saying that your ground spoilers failed but you can look back and see that they're working just fine. Turns out it's just a sensor gone bad. But do you think I flew the plane again until that sensor got fixed? Hell no. So to answer the question, they almost never know. Edit, they don't know until they get the maintenance bill. Edit number two, my highest rated comment and it's probably because someone read it while on the toilet. I used to design avionics and power distribution systems for private jets. You don't want to know how much paperwork goes into those systems to make them FAA compliant. My god the paperwork. Not a pilot but used to do work on one's house. My favorite story was the time the heater went out in the cockpit but not in the rest of the plane. So the pilot and crew are up there freezing. Putting all their clothes on trying to warm up. Instruments and whatnot are freezing up. They had no idea if they were going to be able to land. We were flying DFWHNL, Dallas, Honolulu. We were about 30 minutes past the point of no return and then the captain informs us, flight attendants, that he had to shut one engine down because it was overheating. We had about two and a half hours until we could reach any kind of land. We had a new hire, two months. Working the flight that got very emotional and started saying things like I don't want to die in a panicked voice. We had to shush her so passengers wouldn't start freaking out. As time progressed I tried to ignore the fact that the other engine could crap out or we could have a bird strike or any number of things could go wrong. I started casually going through the cabin and rechecking all of the emergency equipment on board. To calm the new hire down I took her through with me to try and remind her of her training. Just as she started calming down I noticed a strange noise coming from the functioning engine. It was the sound it makes when we are changing speeds around the time we are about to land. We were still 1 hour 40 minutes out. The captain gives us another call and my heart sank. Just as he called a passenger gets up out of his seat and collapses right in the aisle. His shirt caught on the armrest and ripped his shirt wide open. His wife screams. There are four flight attendants on this flight so someone else answered the call from the captain and I had to deal with this. In my mind I am thinking how am I going to secure this guy if we are going down. Should I just leave him there and answer the phone? I need to know what the captain is saying. Meanwhile the wife is trying to wake him up and I'm asking my coworker to get medical equipment. I immediately switch to first responder mode once I see him turn pasty white. None of these passengers know about our engine problem and only a few notice this guy passed out in the aisle. I saw him fall so I was the caretaker. The runner calls for any medical personnel on board and tells me that she can't call the captain because he's still talking to the lead. Alright we have that going on too. By the time a paramedic comes the guy is waking up but says his chest is really tight. He coughing and looks almost gray. We hook him up to oxygen and get him back to his seat. The paramedic says we need to land soon, ha ha, and get him to a hospital. As we get him back to his seat I notice the lead flight attendant has a yellow life vest on and is coming towards me. Oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. She tells me that the captain was able to turn the engine back on and that we should be landing in about an hour. We send up the message about the sick passenger. I know most passengers had no idea about any of this. I was standing there in the back galley, sweating from helping this guy back to his seat, stressing about the poor new hire who we locked in the bathroom and just trying to gather myself. A passenger slowly walks up to me, stretching, yawning, pulls his earbuds out and asks, how much longer? Are you guys going to come out soon with the drink cart? Can I have a Sprite? All I could do was laugh at myself for getting so worked up. We landed with no incident. Edit, she was wearing the life vest because she was checking the demo bags and these kids saw her and were curious how the vest worked. I'm not a pilot or flight crew but I am an aircraft hydraulics specialist in the United States Air Force. Had a jet EFE, in flight emergency, for loss of hydraulic quantity. Turns out a clamp had broken on the side of the engine and the pressure line from one of the hydraulic pumps had chaffed. Lost all hydraulics and had to use all backup systems and the jet had to be towed all the way from the runway to the flight line. It was an AWACS so there is a rather large flight crew in the back that just operates the computer systems. I'm sure some of them didn't know that they were in such a critical situation. 